Hello everyone, welcome back to Not A Real Road Test. This is autumn season in Forza Horizon 4 and today I'm going to show you the 2010 Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor or the police cruiser version of the American workhorse of the 2000s and briefly the 2010s. While Americans probably have seen this car everywhere in their lifetime, people like me marvel at their mere existence on the rare occasion we see them on this side of the Atlantic. This is what prompted me to spend over a million Forza credits at an auction to buy one. Today we're going to drive this utilitarian machine stock, see how we can improve the way it drives, and then drive the better version of itself. Being autumn, you quickly forget about the bright sun and intense heat the summer brought, and focus on the reality of the wind, the greyness, the rain, and the slippery surfaces caused by the rain. This car has a live rear axle, so I thought it'd be amusing to play with that in these lacklustre weather conditions. The inevitability of the autumn rain and greyness is similar to the inevitability that you'll see a seemingly civilian Crown Victoria in your mirror and debate whether it's a cop or just an ex-cop car. If I moved to stateside, this would probably be something I'd have daily just for the experience, until recently that is. And I say that because I'll be quite honest here, I'm pretty conflicted at the time of recording because recently these vehicles, and specifically the police versions, have come into the worldwide spotlight because of the appalling culture surrounding some of the civil servants who drive these cars. I cannot continue without highlighting this point. But today, I'm going to put that to one side and focus on the car itself rather than the people who drive it. So I like the novelty of these cars on this side of the pond, since in the UK we don't get full-size saloons anymore, and I find it amusing how long Ford Crown Victorias were for sale, despite how technologically basic they were from that era. It's built on a body-on-frame layout, it's physically intimidating, it has a huge engine, but with a modest power output, and a live rear axle. Because, Murica. That explains why I'm focusing on this car today. Now let's go drive it. This Crown Victoria is the second generation and it was sold in civilian form from 1998 to 2012. And this police interceptor was sold from 98 to 2011. This second generation was one of the last Fords ever that was based on the iconic Panther platform, the full size body on frame layouts. And in one form or another, the Panther has been around since 1979 and died with this second generation Crown Vic. Now, how many films set in the US have you seen where the Crown Vic appears in crowds as either taxi cabs or police vehicles? Countless, I'm sure. And that's because its interior was vast and the whole car was cheap to buy and cheap to maintain with durable parts. This was the philosophy with full-size American sedans, as they're called. Ultimately, newer competitors like the 2000s Dodge Charger and the Chevrolet Impala were more expensive, but were more technologically advanced as well. Nothing proves this point better than the car not making production beyond 2012 due to the architecture of the Ford Panther platform on which this car is based not being able to support electronic stability control of all things. This was a requirement for 2012 model year vehicles sold in America and Canada. Ford obviously didn't get this memo and so the final batch of cars leaving the factory in 2012 found homes in the Middle East. This was just one factor of many in the outdated design, so quel surprise really that the Taurus, the next generation full-size Ford saloon, spawned an interceptor model. To give you an idea of how old some of the technical infrastructure in this car is, let's go through some of the notable updates. For the 2003 model year, the Crown Victoria gained a rack and pinion steering setup, which replaced a recirculating ball system which earlier Panther platform vehicles used. Rack and pinion seemed pretty standard to me. In 2006, the car became the last in the entire Ford Motor Company to receive a tachometer on the dashboard. You'd have assumed these things would have been fitted from the start of this car's life, or even in the previous generation, but apparently not. That's probably because Ford wanted to focus their efforts on fitting the police interceptor with valuable upgrades over the civilian car. And indeed, there are a number of upgrades. Take for example the external oil to engine cooler, which reduces the engine oil temperature to allow the interceptor to operate at higher engine loads and RPMs for longer without overheating the oil and causing resulting engine damage. The police interceptor's TCU is tuned for more aggressive transmission shift points, with the transmission from the standard car being modified for harder shifts. 
the police interceptor also gets stiffer springs and dampers compared to the standard car, presumably to accommodate a greater load. 20mm of additional ground clearance is gained, and while the regular Crown Victoria doesn't have rear anti-roll bars, this police interceptor does. So there's a mix of updating to recent tech as late as possible, as well as some thoughtful modifications to create a better than original police cruiser here. The PI's power comes from the 16-valve version of Ford's 4.6-litre modular V8. This unit develops 250 brake horsepower at 5,000 rpm and 297 pound-feet of torque at 4,000 rpm. These are low figures given the engine displacement, but I think the aim with these engines was reliability at high loads. This V8 engine is mated to a 4-speed automatic transmission, as with what feels like every American car had between the 80s and the late 2000s. The PI weighs in at 1900 kilos, but I don't know what else we were expecting given the body on frame platform and the sheer size of the thing. You'll somehow get from 0 to 60 in over 8 seconds and onto a top speed of 120 to 130 miles an hour, depending on the chosen differential. In Horizon 4, the Crown Vic is weirdly classed as retro muscle, so it rivals cars like the 87 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am, the 93 and 2000 SVT Mustang Cobra Rs, and the 99 Dodge Viper GTS ACR, though its most direct competitor in Forza would be the 96 Chevrolet Impala SS. In real life, it's far from retro muscle, as you'd expect, and more of a full-size saloon. The Chevy Impala and Dodge Charger from the late 2000s are both close arrivals, despite being more technologically advanced owing to their later releases. They're also used as police vehicles, but the Crown Vic is one of a kind in that it was the very last mainstream rear-wheel drive, full-size, body-on-frame American saloon. Here it has a performance indicator of 521, which places it at the bottom end of the C performance class. What I find amusing about the Crown Vic Police Interceptor is that they start at like 800,000 credits at Forza auctions, with buyouts being at around 2.5 million sometimes. It's an exclusive car, but it's still quite a high asking price given what you get on paper, though in real life you can pick up a used Police Interceptor for around 2,000 US dollars. So with all of those thoughts in mind, let's go and see how the Crown Victoria Police Interceptor drives in stock form. It just feels weird to be driving this kind of car on the left-hand side of the road because <laughs> I think I've only seen about two Crown Victorias in the UK because no one's mad enough really to import them here. The acceleration isn't as bad as I thought it would be actually, as in the 0-60 acceleration. I already had a preconceived kind of, not opinion, but oh wow this is a bit of a boat you've got your expectation versus reality kind of thing. I thought the reality of this would be quite slow, but it's not as slow as expecting. I thought I'd test this on the highways just to have a positive start with this car because its main weaknesses will not be acceleration, top speed. Building some speed now. This is probably the kind of speed that these vehicles are used to. That's what they were modified for. We got to fourth gear, finally. Yeah, I'm glad this can get to an okay speed. One thing you have to consider as well is old style automatic transmissions. Their mechanical efficiency isn't great compared to a manual or a dual clutch. That's part of the reason. I know I said the speed wasn't bad, but when I'm going up the hill, it's slightly painful. I'm not able to recognise the torque that's in the middle of the rev range because there's only a few gears and they're just really widely spaced, so I'm never going to notice. <laughs> Do I have to break up that fight? This is an old style torque converter automatic transmission. The shift time isn't really there. Hey, that was a cool drift. That's the benefit of soft suspension. Okay, I'm understeering, yes. That is the problem with such a heavy car. I did just diss the transmission, but if you compare it with other automatic transmission American vehicles that are under a certain price, this would probably be on the better side. As a European motorist, I just can't tell. I do quite like the engine sound. It's a distinctly American sound. 
It's a bit of a weird engine though because you think it's quite an understressed engine. It feels like all the torque is the middle over top. I was expecting it to really struggle at some of these corners but it's only the tighter corners that I have to break for and have to think about. It's handling these fine and that surprises me quite a lot. It certainly doesn't have the poise of the Integra Type R I drove some time ago, or the Pima or anything like that. But hey, not too bad. But when you're combating... Jesus. Low speed corners, don't try them in this car stock. One thing that's not too bad about this car is, when you're going too fast into a corner, you just slow down sometimes with a bit of understeer. It's kind of comical, actually. I feel like I'm putting in a lot of effort, but I'm just not not turning very much or very quickly. Oh, ooh, yeah. You can definitely feel the weight of this near two-ton vehicle when you're in the corners. When you're diving in, you're not diving in. You're kind of just really trying hard to push it in, but it does go if you're not too ambitious. Okay, I did joke about the torque before. <laughs> it does exist because I was just fishtailing out the corner. Yeah, warm up the tyres. Its handling limits are reached quite easily, but if you do what I'm doing, I turned left and then I turned back right quite suddenly, you get it into a drift or a power slide or a mess like I have. I can burn the tyres as much as I want because the American taxpayer will pay for me. <laughs> I don't think those windscreen wipers are going to be much use with the tyre smoke, are they? It's kind of interesting in terms of handling characteristics. When you're being serious, and you want to go somewhere, it understeers a lot, there's just not a lot of grip, you can't make a lot of progress. However, if you try and disrupt that, get it to have fun a bit, it will have fun because you counter steer from where you were originally pointing, you can get a pretty nice drift. See that? At a low speed corner, I just need to get it to drift a bit and then it's fine. Oh, this guy's after me. I'm actually kind of scared because the Buick's coming pretty quickly. Ah, he's after me! Wait, shouldn't there be roll reversal here? Now I'm chasing him. I'm actually going to just try and pit him. He's getting away because he's in the GNX Turbo. I can't remember the stats off the top of my head. But, they were known for being pretty fast. High speed police pursuit. Who'd have thought this would have happened? Oh, I missed the opportunity to pit him. And I missed that influence sign as well. Oh, come on Crown Vic. I know not every criminal will be driving a Buick GNX Turbo, but some of them might be. Uh, I think I've got him, stand by. There we are. Proceed stand down. Code 6 is in custody. That of course quite a scene on the beach for these non-existent drive tiles. <laughs> He's just... <laughs> yes, okay, I'm done now. It's not an offensive car. I do like the looks. That could be more because I know what this car is. But it's not trying too hard. It's certainly not a pretty car or a glamorous car. Given the target market for this car, I don't think revolutionary styling was on Ford's priority list when designing the Crown Victoria. It's a fairly conservative design and that will do just fine for the fleet buyers and the taxi drivers and the police officers who drove this. Comparing it to the 2000 Mustang SVT and the 87 Pontiac Trans Am, its handling isn't as good. Despite those cars having big engines, I guess the SVT is powerful, is fast, the Trans Am not so much. Neither of those cars decelerate quite as badly as this one uphill. 
and they're both sharper in the corners as well, owing to smaller body sizes. So we're kind of on the back foot if we're going to get this car to stand a chance against its rivals. I suppose the only upside of this car compared to the other retro muscle cars is you can throw four of the drive tars in the cabin with you. And the Impala also has that. Not that that will ever happen. Driver tars are famously bad for car sharing in this game. It's a principle that does not yet exist. So that's where we're at with the stock Crown Victoria Interceptor. Let's go and sort it out by tuning it. What's this? I believe this engine swap is that out of the Shelby GT500 Mustang. We've got to have that, surely. We're in the Forza tuning shop now. I'll just remind you of where this car is in terms of its strengths and weaknesses. So the good points are the engine is a really good starting point, actually. I did make fun of it a bit in terms of its specific power output compared to the engine displacement, but it's actually an easy point to improve. And I did enjoy how easy it was to get the Crown Victoria Police Interceptor to drift as well. It does make sense reflecting on it, but I kind of forgot about that. I was focusing on all the downsides, but the ease of drifting this car and fishtailing it was fun. And that is true muscle car. However, I wasn't impressed with the acceleration or lack thereof, especially going up the hill. And that's partly to do with just how wide the gear ratios are and how lazy the transmission feels to shift. Not to mention, I didn't like how little this car gripped. I couldn't corner very fast and it felt like it was struggling quite a bit on some of the sweeping sections, although it was coping fine, but I could tell it was struggling a bit and there was quite a lot of understeer in the corners. But some of you might be thinking, I'm missing the point here. This is a retro muscle car, and to a degree, I am missing the point. Muscle cars are all about their fishtailing abilities and, to an extent, their drift, as well as straight line speed. So, from some perspectives, the grip and agility and understeer doesn't matter too much. I am going to fix that, but I'm going to focus on the power and the ease of drifting with this car. All the other things can be secondary modifications. As a retro muscle car, it needs to be able to execute brilliant burnouts, the odd bit of drifting, getting off the line fairly quickly, boasting a lot of power, being able to hit pretty good top speeds. Will that be enough to compete with its rivals? Probably. We can make the handling of the car good, but we can make the points I mentioned about how easy it is to drift and so on. We can make those the standout features of the tuned Crown Vic. First things first, race tyres. They just improve every single aspect of a car, especially the grip. Get all the power upgrades. The engine will sort out the power for sure. We can improve shift times by fitting a race clutch. We can get a differential just in case, but I don't think we'll need it. We definitely need a race transmission because the race transmission is going to improve the shift times, but we can play with the ratios as much as we want. Actually give it useful gear ratios for the kind of driving we're going to be doing. Sort out the brakes. I noticed the Crown Vic it liked to roll like a boat. Now it wasn't as boaty as some of the land yachts you got from the 60s and 70s, but this is the modern day equivalent of those, so we need to really keep the rolling and the diving under control. kind of want this to still look sleeperish, so I'm going to keep the rim size at 18. But I've given it wider tyres as well to manage our power increase. We'll still be able to drift though, so don't worry about that. First things first, I want to get the gear ratios right. So whenever I have an American car that stock has a bit of an old gearbox and I then buy a new race transmission for it, they usually come with six gears. I usually tweak the ratios to be like the Corvette C5. Now the reason I do that is because it gives the modified car a distinctly American gear ratio setup. So you have a really tall fifth and sixth gear, but the rest of the gears are a bit shorter. And I give it a final drive that is actually practical when you're sort of racing and cornering. If you want to do the same, you're welcome to steal these gear ratios off me. I haven't increased the sway bar stiffness too much because I still need a bit of roll to get the Crown Vic to drift more. If I make it too stiff, it's just going to be a bit unsettled. I want some controlled drifting 
This isn't a 911 GT3 RS, it needs to be easy to control, like a muscle car, not like a track car. And although the sport suspension has slammed the ride height right down, I know this isn't really a police car in the game, I still kind of want it to have its ground clearance that it had before. So I'm going to reduce the ride height a little bit from its original, but not by too much. I've selected my tune, so let's go and see how the new and improved Crown Victoria Police Interceptor drives. We're getting into serious speeds now. The old car never did 130. Oh, and look at how loose it got there. Yep, that's a bit of drift there. A bit of environmental damage there. And we're spitting flames as well. Oh, look at that. And I controlled it. I'm not the best drifter, but I managed to keep that under control. I'm starting to get the hang of braking in this car as well. It's not an Audi RS6. They can only do so much, these new brakes, because of the weight of this car. I didn't want a weight reduction bro this car, because in my mind, this is a muscle car. You don't take out its creature comforts to enhance the performance. That's more a track toy slash lightweight sports car type deal. Nothing like that should be done for a big American bruiser like this. Ah, I missed the corner. You guys probably think I'm an idiot for not <laughs> weight reducing the car to help braking. That's not the point though. This power is addictive. And the drifting. This is one beast of a police interceptor now. Wow. Before, in the untuned Crown Vic, you'd go into a corner and you'd understeer. Whereas now, you don't understeer as much, courtesy of the wider tyres are fitted. And the huge improvement in power and torque causes this car not to oversteer at corner entry. That oversteer kicks in sort of when you're exiting the corner or the middle of the corner. It's made the car more exciting, more muscle car-like, more of a hoop. The downside is <laughs> sometimes if you're not paying attention, you just uh, lose control. It's a bit of a handful. It was a good call to not go mad with the sway bar stiffnesses. Otherwise, it'd be even harder to control the drifts. And it's not too difficult. Depends what gear you're in and the circumstances. But for the most part, I am just about okay at controlling the drifts. I bet those of you out there who can drift properly, you would enjoy this and you would make a success of this car as a drift vehicle. The engine swap has been all for the best. It's more responsive than the old unit. And that's what you'd expect because this is now the GT500 engine, obviously more of a performance vehicle than the regular Crown Vic or the regular Mustangs of old. The torque is just insane. and It's just there pretty much from your mid-range and still stays there in your higher revs. In the open corners that were manageable but by no means comfortably executed, those can be handled with quite a lot of confidence and speed. We're now hitting speeds that were just impossible before. I'm just impressed with the speed of this. If you look at those speed figures rise and the rate at which they're rising, you would think this was a supercar. But no, it's a 800 horsepower Crown Vic. <laughs> That's what the muscle car philosophy is all about. You take a big almost land yacht or semi land yacht and you just improve the engine so much that you develop ridiculous amounts of power. It doesn't matter how easy they are to control though it's a bonus if they can drift. I think I was missing the point before we tuned the Crown Vic. I was really complaining about its agility and so on. And those criticisms were legitimate but I think I blew them a bit out of proportion. I'm causing so much environmental damage. Before we had bit of an ocean liner. Now we've got more of a speedboat. I'm using boating analogies because it's certainly not a maneuverable car, but it's more maneuverable and that's what we wanted. If you wanted you could get the other retro muscle cars to this level of power. 
you know, the 93 and 2000 Mustangs and the Dodge Viper ACR, they would be better at handling. They'd be fun in a different way. So more fun in a, I'm going around this corner really quickly, really smoothly sense versus I'm not going around this corner too quickly, but I am shredding a lot of tires. So it's easier to tune this car like a true muscle car than those other cars. The other cars can be made to be sports cars in their own right. This, it's impossible unless you threw out all the seats and the weight and everything. And even then, there's only so much weight you can throw away. Therefore, it is more of a muscle car, more of a true muscle car. It might be more difficult to win races, but you'll certainly remember those races. This car is ridiculous. Before it was ridiculous because its platform couldn't even accommodate electronic stability control. Now this is ridiculous because it's got 800 horsepower and an addiction to drifting. What a car. Now that was quite some transformation, which was ultimately necessary. We started off with a chassis that could loosen up a bit with the right inputs, allowing occasional drifts that could be contained and controlled, as well as easy fish tailing when presented with a slow, first gear corner. But slow would also be the way that you summarised your journeys in the stock Crown Victoria, with those wide and lazy gear ratios, and a sedate chassis that aimed for the pavements and trees rather than the actual racing line everywhere else. Some tuning was to be carried out if we were to ever train some hidden muscle in the police interceptor. We began by swapping the old engine with that out of a 2013 Shelby Mustang GT500, a 5.8 litre V8 specifically developed for high power output and supercharged to further quench the thirst for power. But with great power comes great responsibility. So we had to marry the power plant with an effectively geared race transmission to get as much torque to the wheels as possible. And we widened the tyres just so that they could accommodate the power hike while leaving enough scope for me to execute drifts, burnouts and fishtailing. We struck a similar balance with the shock absorber and anti-roll bar stiffnesses. That's stiff enough to limit the untuned car's body roll problem, but not so stiff that we lost the ability to navigate our new beast through drifts and we couldn't forget about upgraded brakes for good measure. Once we left the tuning shop, I was met with more exuberant drifts, but needing to respond with a lot of attention required for adequate control, though I'm not exactly a drifting pro. I did however find it more manageable in the dry than in the wet or damp, and our tuned car felt far less like a boat than it originally did. Upon leaving those drifts, I then had the might to push me to supercar-like speeds, with that marvellous V8 motor coming into its own with quick responses and a wide power band. It meant we finished with a car that was enjoyable to drive, not in terms of getting from A to B quickly, but getting from A to B very mischievously. All courtesy of that performance makeover, it felt like I was driving a completely different car altogether. And we achieved all of those aspects that the retro muscle car philosophy touches on. Straight line speed, burnouts, fishtailing and drifts. The handling improvements are merely a bonus. With retro muscle, handling gains, in my opinion, aren't as important simply because of the limited scope in improving a live rear axle suspension system, which all retro muscle cars seem to have anyway. And the retro muscle car group in Forza Horizon 4 seems to have a lot of exclusives, which muddies the waters when it comes to value for money conversations about the Crown Victoria. With this group, you're trying to get as much muscle car experience as you can, including with your tuning. Remembering this factor actually introduces more clarity, however. The 2000 Mustang and the 99 Viper become more like muscle-influenced sports cars with the right treatment, while as a car like the 87 Firebird Trans Am can be tuned more like a traditional muscle car. I have a feeling that the Holdens in the group will act more like jaw-swaying lunatics, being older and saloons, and while the Impala SS was the performance version of its model line, I know from experience that that car is on the same part of the spectrum as well once it's tuned. Hence I have a sneaking suspicion that our modified Crown Vic is on the extreme end of cruiser-tuned maniac territory. Now whether it's worth it to you or not depends on if you're willing to put in the work to earn the credits to pay for one at an auction, or to do the numerous seasonal challenges to win one. Objectively, I still think it's stupendously expensive for what it is in stock form, though value for money does get better with tuning. 
If you're a return on investment kind of person, you might rack up more miles in this than most of your collection. But now that I've tuned it, I've really warmed to mine. After all, value is subjective. I had to think about the song that best summed up my experience with the Crown Victoria Police Interceptor, and I concluded with Rock City by Kings of Leon from their 2013 album Mechanical Bull. In the 2010s, the rock scene had a bit of a decline in North America, with Kings of Leon being one of the few bands that most people have heard of to still stand. This has parallels with how Ford were pretty much the last car manufacturer to keep churning out body-on-frame passenger cars, even GM phased out body-on-frame saloons in the late 1990s, and that's saying something. Rock music will never die, though, obviously. Rock City gives me glam rock sensations, a genre that was born in the 1970s. The Ford Panther platform also came to be in the 70s, albeit at the latter end. The Crown Vic makes use of a relatively modern engine in an otherwise old-school architecture with old-school design principles. While both modern and classic rock elements are present in Rock City, it's the classic feel which really prevails. And in the modern musical landscape of cross-genre efforts and international influences, the song rings true with the car in that it has an unapologetically rock-rooted feel. As the Crown Vic is unapologetically rooted with its live rear axle, body on frame, V8 motor, sedan, attitude. So there we are. This was the 2010 Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor. Give it a whirl in some road racing, street racing and drag races. And the song that summed up my experience in this car was Rock City by Kings of Leon. Check out the links to the song in the description from Spotify, Apple Music and YouTube. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing. And if you haven't seen my other content, feel free to have a look at my channel. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.